When I think about composers, I often wonder what their music would have been like if things had been different for them. What if they'd been poor instead of rich? Married instead of single? Or female instead of being male? Today on A Note to You, we'll hear all about a fascinating 20th century woman, a wonderful composer, who brings all those questions to mind. Rebecca Clark. I'm Virginia Eskin. We're going to talk about Rebecca Clark today on the program, and they called her the glorious Rebecca Clark. And I think you'll understand why by the end of the program. She was a very beautiful woman. She was the first woman to specialize in composition at the Royal College of Music back in London. And she was the first to do a lot of things. She played professionally in an orchestra when that wasn't a commonplace thing to do. And most importantly, she happened to be a marvelous composer. And that probably is what caught my eye years ago about her. And in a few minutes, I'll be speaking with Leanne Curtis, who spent a lot of effort and probably money and time going back and forth to England, researching the life and times of our composer, Rebecca Clark. But before we turn to Leanne, let's sort of get the sound of what Clark's music is like. I want you to hear a little bit of her music so you get the flavor of what we're talking about when we call her marvelous. The beginning of her viola sonata, which is what we're going to listen to, starts in a very commanding way. The the viola leads off. I can't think of any other piece that really begins that way, and she does a similar thing in her great piano trio. It goes... like wake-up calls and then she sort of hits you on the head and then pretty soon she calms down and it becomes very seductive the way she oozes along. And she definitely has her own very peculiar and individualistic way of writing and It reminds me a little bit of the other composers who were writing in the 20s and the 30s. They're trying to establish a new language. They're using new harmonic, you could call them gimmicks. They're putting notes that don't live happily side by side. And it brings to mind the way the clothing looked in those days, too. People would wear sort of orange along with maroon and chartreuse alongside of purple. If you look at the clothing that women wore in the 20s and all that Bakelite strange jewelry, everybody's looking for a new language in the arts. And Rebecca Clark was a real trailblazer, and she writes this beautiful music for the darker strings and, of course, the violist lover. So let's have a little bit of her viola sonata so you can get the flavor. Thank you. 
So that's just a portion of the first movement of Rebecca Clark's Viola Sonata. It was being played by Patricia McCarty and myself, Virginia Eskin. And we're talking about the interesting British composer, Rebecca Clark. And to help us get some perspective on her life, I've invited Leanne Curtis, who knows a great deal about Rebecca Clark. And she's a resident scholar in women's studies at Brandeis University here in the Boston area. In fact, she's writing a biography of Rebecca Clark. How did you get involved in this wonderful life? Well, Virginia, I was um, a graduate student and working in the music library shelving books, and I just came across the reprints of these big works, the viola sonata and the piano trio. Where was that happening? Oh, I was in North Carolina at the time. So they just caught my eye, and especially because I'm a cellist, and she writes such beautiful music for the strings. So... um, and I was always curious about that. And the preface to the reprint of the Piano Trio told a little bit more about Clark and some of her unpublished music. So it just seemed like an interesting thing to investigate. That's an understatement. And then what was your first step in doing that? Well, Clark's estate manager, um, Christopher Johnson, wrote the preface to the Piano Trio. And so he was the person I contacted then to find all these you know, um, materials like the diaries and her memoir, and it's just been a fascinating exploration. What year would that have been? When I started it, it was, um, when I actually got around to contacting him, it was 1991. But I think already in the 80s, I had encountered the recordings that you made and you know, got interested in her music. Well, that's very nice. And how did Rebecca Clark get her start in music? Well, she was from a musical family, and um, her father was an amateur cellist, and all the children were groomed to play stringed instruments so they could have chamber music at the home, and this was near London. Um, And so she played a lot as an amateur, and then she started to study violin and went first to the Royal Academy of Music and then studied composition at the Royal College of Music. Do we know why she switched from the Royal Academy to the college? Well, her father was very temperamental, and there was this incident where um, one of her teachers at the Royal Academy proposed a marriage, and her father abruptly withdrew her from the Royal Academy, and then she was on her own at home for a while before then she um, enrolled in the Royal College in composition. And I know it's been so helpful to me getting a handle on her life. The wonderful pictures that you have are reproductions. She's a very pretty woman, very uh, sensual looking. Very tall and elegant, and some people described her as looking like a Greek goddess on the stage I in believe her beautiful it. gowns. Yeah. So the father was having uh, the proper reaction for, the, for that time. That would be what, 19... I think it was about oh. 1907 when she was pulled out of the Royal Academy, and then she went back to the Royal College. And according to an article I read that you wrote for Strad Magazine, he also was kind of a mean father. He wasn't against stra- taking the strap to her. And Right. All the four children were, were beaten. It was kind of, uh, you know, he's very tyrannical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that, she never actually finished at the Royal College because of an incident where um, she confronted him about, he was having extramarital affairs, and she confronted him, and he was so furious that he threw her out of the house. And she writes about this in her memoir, um, you know, that she started to earn her living as a violist from that day, and she was very proud that she made her way as a professional woman. Because would it have been common for women to study music at a place like the, the Royal College in those years? Well, the Royal College was coeducational, but women were sort of on different tracks, you know, because so many of the professional jobs were for men and the orchestral jobs. Preparing them to go into orchestras. Right, and then the women were supposed to be teachers or... Um, but she was actually the first woman to study composition with Sir Charles Stanford, who was the teacher of Von Williams and Holst and many of the big names of 20th century and British. And what a w- wonderful music. instrumentalist and an orchestrator himself. Right. That was right. a um, mm-hmm. serendipity for her. Mm-hmm. Um, what can you tell me about this Morpheus piece? Well, Morpheus is an early piece, and she wrote it for viola and piano. And that was one of the pieces, I think, that she wrote to play herself. She wrote for her career as a violist and to have a solo work to play because there wasn't a whole lot of solo music for viola. It was really just coming into its own as a solo instrument at the time. 
and that's very British too, because the the um, composers around that time, Ireland, Elgar, mm -hmm. they loved woodwind music. They were um, concentrating, you know, instead of the music of the Romantic era, which had featured the violin and the piano, all this new sound was... Some different timbres. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's listen to Morpheus by Rebecca Clark, and it's a viola piece, viola and piano.
So that was Morpheus by Rebecca Clark, and it was played by Paul Coletti and Leslie Howard. And I'm speaking with Leanne Curtis today about the wonderful life of our British composer, Rebecca Clark. And eventually she makes her way to America, but we're in her British period. Now, you just showed me an old concert program from 1918, which includes this piece that we just heard, Morpheus. But it says it was composed by someone named Anthony Trent. I don't mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. Well, that was, she was trying to make her mark in New York, um, but she explains in an interview that she felt a little bit self-conscious about having her name on the program so many times as composer and as violist. So she came up with this pseudonym. It's a very interesting story. Well, let's hear her voice. And uh, Oh, I'll tell you something that will amuse you. Uh, I played once at a recital in the old town hall, and I played um, two groups. And in each group, there was something that I'd written myself, because you know there are awfully few solos for viola. And I think I also played some duets. But anyhow, I wanted rather to play another piece I'd written. And um, I thought, this is too silly to put my name down. This was before the viola sonata affair. And it seemed too silly to put my name down still once more. So I thought, I'll invent a name. So I went through the rivers of England until I thought came across what sounded like a handy a surname, and I took the name Trent. And I took the first name Antony because I liked that name. And this is one for women's lib because although the piece by Antony Trent was not um, particularly good, it had much more attention paid to it than the pieces that, that I had written. I mean, in my own name which is rather a joke, and people would ask me about Anthony Trent, and I was rather self-conscious at having invented him, and I think I would blush, I still <laughs> could blush in those days, and I would blush, and I think I could see in their faces that they thought, ah, oh, yes, there's a romance somewhere, you know. Rebecca Clark speaking herself in an interview. And I think her modesty does come across in that, that, you know, her embarrassment at, you know, putting herself forward on the program. But then later she, you know, went, she, this interview was made in 1976, and there she has the perspective, you know, that she did, you know, was treated unfairly, that Anthony Trent got more attention than the pieces she wrote in her own name. So she realizes that, you know, being a woman was sometimes a difficult thing. <laughs> to put it mildly. Yeah, that the little clip we heard it was made very recently in '76. But when she's using the Anthony Trent name, that's way back, right? Nineteen eighteen, long before women's right. lib, right? Well, she seems to have also written a lot of songs. She she liked that medium. What's special about her songs? Well, she had excellent taste in poetry and literature, and she read quite a bit. So I think that's one of the special things, that she always chooses such beautiful poetry and is bringing the poetry across in, in a reading, you know, that she really understands the oh, words. Absolutely, because it's very important, not only the key that you put a poem in, because that establishes the color and then the context, but for my ears, she's a perfect song composer, Leanne, because there's a wonderful stasis or a, um, she puts down a bed, you know, and that she likes these sort of... Great, like a, like a gouache kind of, she lays that atmosphere, down. Atmosphere, yeah. Atmosphere, right. And then the words can be magical, spilled out mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas, you know, to use a, a great contrast, somebody like Stravinsky, he uses songs in a very pointy, spiky way. Mm -hmm. She's using it in mm -hmm. that wonderful constable English right. Turner kind of style. So it's about that time, 1918 or so, that she meets the poet John Macefield. And what what can you tell us about their friendship? She was in London and lived in London in the early 20s, and it was just this intimate atmosphere among people working in the arts that she could drop him a note and say, you know, Mr. Macefield, I want to set some of your poems. And then the next day he writes it back and invites her to tea. And so they get together and chat about his poetry and her music. And then she would go on and set a couple of these poems. And um, June Twilight is a piece, I mean, this idea of Constable, the landscape, the beautiful British landscape and sort of the undulating fields of grain in the sun. And it's very evocative. <laughs> 
And also we have to add, though, that I love that ex description you wrote about her being such a good mixer. So no wonder. She was very beautiful. She played well. Yes. So he would invite her to tea because she'd be mm -hmm. awfully good company on top of being an interesting young composer. Well, let's listen to a song set to his poetry. It's called June Twilight. That was a song by Rebecca Clark called June Twilight. It was sung by Patricia Wright and accompanied by Catherine Sturrock. And we're talking about Rebecca Clark, and my guest is Leanne Curtis. And we're, as we were listening to that, we were saying she composes, composes so beautifully with this sort of a watery quality. And I know from playing the chamber music and then listening to that song the way it began, that... talking about how her songs remind us of getting in a little boat and sort of launching out to sea and she seems to have a very evocative quality in 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 her writing along with the right love of Re literature really creating atmosphere you know very vivid scenes well we'd, we'd call her an impressionist mm -hmm. yes only uh -huh. of an english bent right not as uh opaque there, there's more definition somehow in her impressionism. Mm, it's, mm -hmm. um, there are guide poise, yes. guideposts yeah. in the music. Yeah. Now we're going to have another sort of literary selection. This is a chorus from uh, poetry by Shelley. It's called Elas. Can you read this, some of the stanzas right, of that? This was so we can um, hear a Greek drama and this chorus, I mean, again, it's a very atmospheric scene and mm -hmm. just her you know, love of English literature. Um, it's to Hesperus, the evening star, and like lovel loveliness panting with wild desire, Hesperus flies from awakening night and pants in its beauty and speed with light, fast flashing, soft and bright. Thou beacon of love, lamp of the free. 
Yeah. So, and this is actually one of the recently published choral piece that, um, one of the first choral pieces to be published. So it's just all coming to light now. It's wonderful. Now, now we can get the music mm -hmm. before it was just a state of mind. Well, let's hear a, a, um, a concert version.
That was Helas, a piece composed by Rebecca Clark, and it was sung by the women's chorus of Coro Allegro with David Hodgkins conducting. And we're talking about Rebecca Clark's music. And my guest is Leanne Curtis. And we were just chatting about that piece, and it was mm -hmm. taken from a sort of concert conference that you organized at Brandeis uh -huh. it was held um, last fall. Yeah, it was on September 25th, and I wanted, um, it was a wonderful opportunity to feature some of Clark's lesser-known pieces, the two choral pieces that have just been published, and um, the viola and clarinet piece that we're going to hear later, that's just been published too, and then some of the pieces, um, some of the songs, and... Um, the string quartets that are not known at all. That are, um, and the man you mentioned before, her nephew, Christopher uh -huh. Johnson, he gave a sort of an address at that conference. He was one of the speakers at the conference, and we had music theorists and um, cultural historians and people coming from California and Oregon and New York. It's and, wonderful. Yes. It's so important. Yeah. That's how one learns about a composer. And you also, on a pragmatic level, give jobs, especially to graduate students, and just like your own story, and certainly mine. You go to conferences, and you mm -hmm. realize somebody needs to be argued for. Right. Yeah. And is September 25th a special day? Well, I had wanted to organize it around, it was the 20th anniversary of her death, and the actual date was October 13th. Um, you know, so she died in 1979, and this was just as close as we could arrange it, you know, with all the logistics. Right. That's great. Well, next we're going to hear something that you truly unearthed, and this is her poem for String Quartet. And it, it got its premiere at this conference that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. the, the area premiere. I mean, there, you know, I did read about these pieces for String Quartet in the catalog that her estate manager prepared back in the 70s with Clark. And, um, but they are unpublished, so you just have to sort of dig out the knowledge of them. And there's actually a copy of this piece in the library at the University of California in Berkeley, and that's the copy that has the title, Poem. You know, so that's where we know that it's called Poem. And, um, you know, and also gives a little bit sort of wider life to that, that piece. But now you say that it's published. So no, that, not this one. Oh, this is still unpublished. Still unpublished, yeah. Oh, well, let's have a listen. It's played by the Lydian Quartet, Poem by Rebecca Clark.
That was Poem for String Quartet, played by the Lydian Quartet, and it was composed by Rebecca Clark. I'm Virginia Eskin, and we're hearing the story of the British-American composer Rebecca Clark today, and my guest is Leanne Curtis. If you'd like to take a moment to drop us a line here at A Note to You, you'll need the address. It's A Note to You, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Our email address is a note to you at wgbh.org. Our program, A Note to You, is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. One of the fascinating things about your study is how fast all of this interest in Rebecca Clark has sort of bubbled up. It, it was just back in 1981 we were agreeing that we started to sort of learn that Clark even existed. And mm-hmm. how, how can from 1981 to 99 we're getting our music published and there's a, a kind of almost a cornucopia of recordings. Right, and the reprints, the reprints of the, the piano trio and the viola sonata, those came out in the 80s, and I think performers have really led the way, you know, because I'm sure I heard your recording of the piano trio and the viola sonata, which were really pioneering Back when recordings. you were in, 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 in North Carolina. Carolina. Uh-huh. Well, it's true. I think that the violists are starved for music to play. There's really not much. And her viola sonata is a very exciting work, and it, it's a showpiece for violists. Yes. So they've taken it to their heart. Right, and she, you know, it was her instrument, and she really understood it and wrote so beautifully for it. And I feel that she writes beautifully for the piano. It's very, It lays yes. under the hands very well. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you were telling me that she would take a walk. I like that story. Oh, right, that um, there's an interview where she describes her compositional process, that she would go out. She loved to walk in the countryside, and the British have such a love of the British countryside. And Don't they ever. And plan things out in her mind, and then come back home and sit at the piano and, and write it out and, and actually write it at the piano Mm -hmm. after working out in her mind. So we're talking about how fast all of this interest in Clark's life Mm -hmm. has bubbled up, because just from the 80s, we now have recordings, quite a few of them, and even cellists have jumped on the bandwagon. They're playing her viola sonata. Mm -hmm. And this next piece, uh, can you tell me something about it, the prelude and allegro for viola and clarinet? Mm -hmm. Well, violists, you know, they have really helped shine a spotlight on Clark and her music, and this is a piece that is just now come out in publication, um, a later work that Clark wrote in 1941, and it's just so different in style from the lushness of the viola sonata. And I think this, um, it really shows sort of a neoclassical side to her, an influence of Stravinsky and kind of some of the spiky harmonies and taut counterpoint. Let's listen to the allegro movement of this piece. Thank you. 
So that was the middle movement from a three-part piece by Rebecca Clark, and it's called Prelude Allegro and Pastoral, played by Patricia McCarty and Peter Hadcock. And my guest today is Leanne Curtis, and we're exploring the life and times of the composer Rebecca Clark. And that piece showed a, a very playful side, mm-hmm. all sorts of spunky rhythms, mm-hmm. and because we don't want to give you the impression as the listener that she was all placid. Hardly. And our next piece has a lot of a sense of humor sort of involved in it, too. Definitely. Uh-huh. The the title I love. The Aspidistra, yeah. And Do you know what an Aspidistra is? Yeah. Well, a, a, a house plant, a unkillable house plant. <laughs> they sometimes live in dry cleaners, and I've noticed they never get watered. They don't die. <laughs> They're sometimes called mother-in-law's tongue. And I think this, this song... Um, it's sort of a, a parody of the 19th century parlor song and just evoking, you know, the, the parlor and the lace curlers, cur- I mean, lace curtains and, uh, you know, the, that whole atmosphere. And in she a, was being a good mixer and right. getting people to laugh. And very well, let's hear one of, her, uh, one of her playful s- songs. It's called The Aspidistra, and then right after that you'll hear one called The Shy One. That was sung by Anthony Rolf Johnson, tenor, and he was accompanied by Graham Johnson. So we're up to the 1930s, and it seems that Rebecca Clark's oeuvre sort of comes to a grinding halt. Why is that? Yeah, she didn't write very much in the 30s, and um, it's a complicated question. I know she was very busy as a violist and doing a lot of performing, um, 
And then also she did state that she had an, an affair with a married man, a singer that took up a lot of her energies. And I think she also just faced some discouragements, difficulties in getting things published. And I know. I've thought that too, that mm-hmm. nothing breeds success like having a little success. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about what a tragedy that she hadn't uh, been able to write jazz band music or join the Charleston or she was too refined. And she didn't get commissions except for, you know, one. But um, I think things were a little more, you know, things were difficult and she was sensitive. Definitely. And why does she move to the U.S. then in 1939? Is it looking for work? Well, she had had always had ties with the U.S. because both her brothers, her brothers settled in the U.S. And so she was actually visiting them. She tells the story in an interview. She was visiting them in the summer of 1939, and war broke out when World War II broke out. And then the British government discouraged her from going back, you know, because they were evacuating in London and food rationing and everything. So she winds up staying in the duration of the war in the U.S. and also then has another spurt of of composing, I think, sort of the disturbance, and it sort of prods her and jolts her back into composing. I like that um, setting because the next piece we're going to hear is composed, you say, about that time in 41. It's Mm -hmm. published in 43, and it's a real homage to England. It's called a Passacaglia on an old English tune, which is actually a hymn. Right. And for those of you who want to know what a Passacaglia is, it's it's like a tone row. It's when you take a short um, series of tones, and in this one, it's four notes in a row. And you'll hear that throughout the piece. It comes back over and over. It's almost like a little fugue. You'll hear. Or between the viola and the piano. Um, and you hear the hymn melody, too. It moves right. around in different levels. And it, it evokes Vaughn Williams. This yes. piece is very handsome. And, and just the longing for, for Britain and nostalgia of British things. Well, here it is, the Pascaglia for viola and piano by Rebecca Clark. So that was just a little portion of Rebecca Clark's viola and piano piece, Passacaglia. And we want to tuck in so much on this interesting interview, and we have another voice clip of her voice, and we want to move to that. So we've got her in America. 
we've got the World War II is raging. Mm-hmm. And tell us, wh- what what is their state of mind? We're now like 1944. Well, in, in 1944, she does, um, she winds up getting married in September of 1944, and that's to an old college friend you know, who she accidentally, sort of the story is, she ran into him, and it was like rain in the desert to... Uh, meet this old friend, and that's James Friskin, and he's a pianist at the Juilliard School, um, and they wind up getting married, and it's this wonderful sort of Cinderella-type um, ending. But then once she... Because she's in her late 50s. She's 58. They're both 58. Uh-huh. And, um, but, you know, once she's married, she takes on this identity as Mrs. James Friskin and doesn't do any composing. I mean, does a little bit of arranging of things, but... But she has a relationship to the great radio station in New York, WQXR, and that's where this interview that we're going to hear comes from, doesn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. I mean, in the 40s, she did do some radio broadcasts and sort of, um, and she would also do things where she would do lecture recitals with Friskin, and I think some of those got on the radio. Well, that would take up some of her time. Mm-hmm. So we have her in New York. We've got her married to James Friskin, and she's still kind of coping with trying to be a composer. Well, she doesn't really write after she is married. I think she was very happy with becoming Mrs. James Friskin and just settled into that identity and did things with him and would give lectures when he gave recitals. Um, But I think it does speak a lot to the conflict she's had her entire life with her identity as a composer, Um, you know, of feeling sort of a not really like she was a composer, sometimes feeling very insecure. And there's this interview where... um, Back referring to the 1919 Viola Sonata, where, you know, um, it was suggested that she didn't really exist. Let's listen to her talking about that. When I I had that one little whiff of success that I've had in my life with the the Viola Sonata, the rumor went went around, I hear, that I hadn't written the stuff myself, Hmm. that somebody had done it for me. And I even got one or two little bits of, I don't know if I've still got them, I, don't, I doubt it, little bits of press clippings saying that uh, it, uh, it was impossible, that I couldn't have, uh, wouldn't have written to myself. And the funniest of all was that I had a clipping once which said that I didn't exist. There wasn't any such person as Rebecca. <laughs> and uh, there wasn't any such person as Rebecca Clark that it was a pseudonym. Now, these people have got most beautifully mixed. Um, It was a pseudonym for Ernest Bloch. And I thought to myself, what a funny idea. When he writes his his very much lesser works, uh, that he should take a pseudonym of a girl that anybody should consider this possible. Oh, so in that interview, I think you sense her uh, feeling of conflictedness about her identity as a composer, and also, you know, that others would, you know, doubt her identity that she even existed and then also the sort of self-deprecation that she um you know thinks it's funny that somebody could mix her up with the great Bloch. and in fact though the 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 two viola sonatas shared the same prize mm-hmm. the they Coolidge tied, prize right. yeah. they tied so a lot of quirkiness happening there well now we're going to go to my favorite piece that she wrote, the piano trio, and we're going to listen to the third movement, and I love the way it sort of spunks along, and it has all sorts of almost Chinese sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Open fifths, and she loves this, all this, where you put two, almost like Slonimsky did, you put black keys together Uh with white keys. Polytonality. Polytonality, Uh right, on top of each other, and... Then sometimes the two string players have all the rhythm and the piano is very static and then just the opposite. So it goes back and forth and it's a it has a novel sound. And then on top of it, of course, the the rhythm changes. I'm looking at four eight and then five eight and then seven eight and the mm-hmm. sort of thing that a lot of musicians, when they look at that, they say, you know, it's I'm gonna have to count here and they might not be uh, lazy and mm-hmm. want to learn it. Mm-hmm. And but of course now with women composers being a kind of a chic thing, I think the piece gets quite a lot of airings. Yes, uh-huh. there's been some good work. So here's the third movement of Rebecca Clark's trio. Thank you. 
Now, our final piece for today's program is going to be another song, and it's in a wonderful text by the English writer G.K. Chesterton. And what year is she writing this? She wrote this. It's another late work, so you do get sort of a spiky Stravinsky in harmony. It's 1941. So she's writing it once she's in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a Danish soprano, Povla Frisch, who she knew and performed some of her music in New York. Here it is. It's called The Donkey Song. The Donkey Song by Rebecca Clark. He starts off friskily and then he slows down. Very playful, but then you realize it's you know it becomes very spiritual because it's the donkey of the Palm Sunday story. So. Ah, that explains it. Well, it was sung by Sarah Pelletier and accompanied by Sheila Kibi. Our thanks to Leanne Curtis, who's a resident scholar in women's studies at Brandeis University, and she's been doing all this important work on the life of Rebecca Clark. Our engineer today has been Alan Mattis. Our producer is Alan McClellan, and I'm Virginia Eskin. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. It's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio, Boston. <laughs>